Hi guys. Hello. We just wait a minute or two while everybody comes in. Just enjoy a moment of silence. very quiet. Hmm. Okay, welcome everybody to this broadcast of Embercum Online. Uh, we're here with you on Earth Day, which is a moment uh, or day where we can celebrate the Earth across the whole world. And it's actually the 50th anniversary of Earth Day today, so it's such a moment for us to be here. And tonight we are going to ask the question, what's next? Um, we were just having a chat before this started and Manda, who is with us tonight, said something rather beautiful that I wanted to repeat. Um, she was saying that whenever she goes to meditate or pray on the land, it's almost as though everything is holding its breath. And um, I thought that was a beautiful way to start our talk. We have, perhaps I should just tell you who we've got. We've got three people to um, look at this question with us. We have the lovely Amanda Scott, um, author of the Dreaming Boudicca books and many other books as well. This and Dreamer Extraordinaire. We have wonderful Gail Bradbutt with us who is one of the most influential people in the country, in my opinion, and many others. Uh, the co-founder of Extinction Rebellion and um, knows a fair few things about social change and where to go next. And our third person is Max, Max McCartney, who is the founder of Amber Coombe and author of The Fire, which is a beautiful image for our time. And perhaps he will say a little bit more about that. But I would like to pass it over uh, to Manda first. What next? What next? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, what I was saying in our prayer circle before we started is, is that sense that I have. Whenever I do anything, when I dream or I journey or I meditate or I go up the hill to ask for help, is that sense of everything that I've ever connected to holding its breath. That this is. I think I'm be I am beginning to understand the enormity of this moment and its potential for transition and transformation. And I don't really know what next, if I'm honest. What I know is that I need to be very flexible, I need to be ready, and I need to be asking the question, what do you want of me? On a moment by moment basis and endeavoring to answer that clearly. And what I have at the moment, and, and this is my truth for today, and it may well be different by tomorrow, is that we need to have a heart sense, a bodily felt sense of how, how each of us, how I need to know how I would feel if we got it right from here on in, that I, I can't, we can't, I think, as a species, get to where we need to go if we don't know what that feels like. And we have, sadly, quite a lot of maps of how it feels like if we don't get it right. Our, our method of storytelling now is mostly film and television. We don't gather around fires, certainly not in the last three weeks. And we have an infinite number. No, that's an exaggeration. We have a large number. We have Housemaid's Tale. We have 28 Days Later. We have Mad Max. I haven't watched any of these, but I'm told they are really quite detailed visionings of how it would look and feel if things were very bad. And I have only in the last three weeks started really feeling how would I feel if we got it right? On the basis that human intent is the single most powerful force on the planet. When we learn to hone our attention into intention, we can do almost anything. But at the moment, my perception, I'm, I've been on more Zoom calls in the last three weeks than the sum total of the rest of my life. And it wasn't that I wasn't Zooming, it's that everybody wants to Zoom now from Rebel Wisdom to Future Thinkers to New Economics Foundation to Neon to Compass to More In Common to The Alternative. They're all wanting to Zoom and they're all going, what next? And 
And we need a unified answer to that. But I think we also need the pregnant time, the gestational time of feeling our way into it. So for me, the most important thing at the moment is, is that feeling sense. And when I do it, when I meditate, I went up a couple of hours ago um, to do this, my daily practice. If I can really get into a place where I feel as if we have got everything right, there is such a sense of liberation and gratitude and awe and wonder and connectedness. For me, everything is I'm breathing in that sense and I'm breathing it out along the webs of the web of life, the webs of connectedness to everything that is conscious, the, the humans and, the, and the everything in the more than human world. And the sense of connectivity is makes me weep every single time. But so also that sense of release. I don't know how much fight I am holding until I'm not. And, and so for me, somewhere I need to be in that place of fluidity that isn't braced against things. So that's the best I can come up with. Thank you for the question. Fantastic. Gail, what would your, what would your answer be to what next? <laughs> what might happen right next is my kids might come in and start hassling me. So um, just to share that with everybody. Also to say hello to friends on this call, people that I know and love already and uh, to new friends. It's nice to see you and it feels very humbling to be asked such a big question. And obviously I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And um, staying in the joy and celebration of life feels really important to me this year, no matter what happens. Um, I, I see things in layers, um, and if you want a long chat on this, there's a, a talk online called Holistic Theories of Change, if you put my name in. It's from the spiritual to the personal to the cultural to the systemic, and I think the change is, has been and is happening on all of those levels, and we've had got this massive, what they call the Overton window shift at the cultural level, which can go in either direction because there's a lot of fear around. Mm. Um, I think or everything that Manda said, yes, you know, the places to tune in and every, and every place that we can do our own personal practices to let go and to move forward and to heal. Yes. Because both of those things that mean that we'll be ready to help the culture move in the right direction and give the best possible interventions with the work with extinction rebellion and focused at the systemic level. And systemically we are in, unprecedented times really interesting times Paul Mason was on a call with XR recently the economist as was Molly Scott Cato and um, and Pettifor and Paul Mason said this is, not, this is to be honest this is how I was thinking of it and I've done lots of economics in the past but not, not, not an economist but it's like it's not like the 2008 situation when the roof fell in this is the foundations have been pulled out and one of the things that um uh, Molly Cato had said some time ago, she may not remember this, but I remember her saying it, was the problem with the economy is it's like it's this aeroplane flying through the air and we want to change it to a helicopter mid-flight. Well, hey, guess what? That, that aeroplane just landed on the ground and it's gone still for a bit. We have the possibility to change our system and we have the permission check space to change our system. And the people that know this are the neoliberals as well. And if anybody's looked at... Um, the, the shock doctrine work of Naomi Klein, and she's talked online about this piece. It's essentially when there are difficult times, authoritarianism will use that opportunity to, to make things worse. And that's the risk that we're facing. Uh, and I don't need to speak to all the cultural shifts that are happening right now, but there is an opportunity of civil disobedience right now that is pointing its arrow at systemic change. And the civil disobedience, it, uh, this is just the words that we're using at the minute in, in Extinction Rebellion and we're developing something, it's not all landed, it's not all definitely going to happen, but it's called money rebellion at the minute or money strike. And essentially the economic, I don't need to give an economics lecture right now, but the economic system is wired to kill life on earth, right? There is um, every minute our economic system uses $10 million of subsidies for the fossil fuel industry every minute, $10 million. And the UK and its crown dependencies are the number one um, corruption services providers in the world. 
we are, we're the top of the financial secrecy index when you add all the other people in and, and we're helping the world to hide 32 trillion dollars of money that's just dollars um if you stack them up they go to the moon and back four times there is they found the magic money tree in fact it's a magic money forest at the minute so we can do the economy differently and without getting into how that might change as had june chang once said tell me what kind of economy you want and i'll design it for you um you've got donut economics from kate raworth you've got john fullerton's uh, regenerative capitalism you've got paul mason's um post-capitalism you've got molly scott cato's bioregional economics you've got Mar mariana mazzucato on, on, on public value there's so many great ideas out there we've got project drawdown we know what we need to do right and the system will hang on to business as usual and we can put our arrow in the direction of this change but what it will take is for us to say we're not participating in this money system as it's set up right now and how do we do that practically because there's only so many ways that we can do that we have to do that as a collective the power lies in the collective um, there's a process called conditional commitment. It goes, I'll do it if you'll do it. It's a bit of mischief. There's the crow. I'll do it if you'll do it. Um, and obviously, we've all got different circumstances financially. So we would like to, in Extinction Rebellion, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the whole movement, it's a conversation. So it's an idea some of us are, are working with at the minute and have been for some time, get the narrative right, all the rest of it. But say, you know, it's along the lines of we need to reset. We need to reset. We're not bailing out business as usual. Uh, we want to bail out people on planet, we want to deeply adapt to what's coming. And so um, if, if there's going to be a process to keep pushing ahead, as was before, we're not playing. The ball, we're interested in the money rebellion. So you say you're interested, and then we get a bank of a phone bank of people ringing up and gathering information. Maybe you've got a mortgage with Barclays, maybe you're a student with debt, maybe you pay rent. And we gather people together and we see what people are up to and groups of us go forward to make this collective prayer together that says a no to carrying on and a yes to all these brilliant ideas that are out there and i think that's what could come next um and it doesn't need us to get on the streets it doesn't need us to park tube trains or anything like that it just needs us to know that we trust each other and love each other enough to say we're going to do something if you've got no debts you could take out a debt and say i'm not paying you back barclays bank or whatever there's lots of fun to be had here we will obviously have legal advice um, mm. for people but we can develop the th and i don't even want to use the word threat of this but do you know what i mean we can develop our collective energy for this together um yeah so that's what i'd like to see thank you great uh, just a quick question on there then gail so uh do you think there's anybody in the existing system that's up for change? I mean, I know you've been speaking to bankers. Can you say anything about that? Well, I, so, I mean, if we did that, um, the, the, you know, obviously we'd, XR uses the word phrase of demand. And again, I don't really love that language. It's kind of, we're all one human race, right? Demanding something of somebody. But what we're calling for, first of all, would be truth telling. Let's tell the truth, you know. Human, again, language will work differently for different people, but the operating system that humanity is running right now. So working, it's taking us to a cliff. We've got to rethink it. It's not an ideological point, you know? Um, when you start using language like capitalism or anti-capitalism, it gets you really into camps and it's not the way to move forwards, um, in my opinion anyway. Um, so let's leave the space for the bankers, for business people to say, this is not working. Um, and um, that we need to make changes. And we're not all gonna agree on the changes, exactly what needs to happen. But then the second thing we can call for is the Global Citizens Assembly to help rewire humanity. And we've actually put together a significant bid. It's not for XR to run, but there's a group trying to get that to happen. So work is, significant work's happened on that. So, you know, beautiful, imagine that. It would be very few white faces talking about how we want to rewire humanity and working with what you call multi-stakeholder panels and, and anyway so that's a possibility and I, I've heard that there's interest at, at high levels of that happening we have to have these prophetic ideas um so yeah I, th I think I think let's create this to me Extinction Rebellion's job is to create the space um to have the conversation not to have all the answers mm. fantastic create the space for or prophetic ideas. Brilliant, thanks Gail. Mac, what would be your response? 
for the question, what next? Well, what next is uh, one question, but what now uh, feels to me rather more pertinent and relevant. And I think we fail that question almost continuously. We're always asking what next, but we're not bringing ourselves to the moment that exists right under our noses in this very present moment. Mm. And, um, and I think in the same way with what next, we're always looking for saviors and we're always imagining that somehow the mist will clear and things will become, um, there'll be some kind of uh, new state. So I heard it only another webinar yesterday, some indigenous prophe prophecy that says that when we've been through this, then we'll move into eternal peace. And I, I honestly, I just think it's bullshit, really. We, we are complex and, and our complexity will not get unraveled and sorted and healed in, you know, within a, a few hundred years at least and probably thousand. You know, we have right now to take a very good look at who we are individually in the way that we conduct our lives with our children, with our partners, within, and also the internally, the wild dogs, that often rule the roost in terms of how we behave, respond, react, and create. And that would be a really good start. And I think it's now a long time since Jung said something approximating to the, to the same theme. I think that we, uh, a million small risks is being invited right now, you know, in this moment now, how are we speaking with our neighbors? How are we bringing ourselves to the, over the garden fence, as it were? Uh, um, I, I sit here thinking to myself, you know, all previous governments, as far as I can see, looking back in our country, have failed the countless numbers of people who have uh, responded uh, in this latest election to go with Boris and the story that he was telling. And, and the same in Trump's America, in all those millions of people who, are, who have just grasped the straw that he has offered them, as it were. Because there's never been a proper, we have not learned yet how to build a bridge to the vast majority of people who inhabit each of our countries, who are leading lives which are so very different from almost everybody who will be on this call. And that to me is the question that it just sits with me all the time is how do we take that conversation and not actually preaching, not telling people how things are, but carry things like, and I'm just because it's familiar to me, but stories like the children's fire into all of the places where um, they are just praying and hoping that things return back to normal and that Boris then gets on with the job of, of giving them back the Britain that they thought, that, that they feel has been lost, and that life can get back to normal. Uh, they are not, many of them are considering at all the climate change um, issue. They're not thinking about any issues really, other than how do I get off, you know, get enough food in, my, in, in the house and um, you know, deal with all the ordinary things. So, that for me is, is, you know, this question of what next. It came, I can't remember her name, I'm really bad with this, but when uh, she committed suicide after Love Island, uh, all that process, and she spoke about kindness. This is the test of who we are. Every, every breath and every interaction, every step, then that should be first and foremost and front of how we conduct ourselves. And Lastly, you know, ideas are amazing. Ideas are truly powerful and they, they, they are there. But we are a mind, we are a heart, we are a body and we are spirit. And whatever solution that comes forward needs to speak all, you know, within, braid all of four of those um, uh, threads together as whole human beings speaking to each other as if we really were equal. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Mac. I, you, you said something um, in your conversation about Earth Day. You said, you know, how you wanted to be part of the birthing that's going on um, at the moment. I just wonder, you know, obviously it'll be different for all of us, but how can you, how can we as individuals kind of be there to support this birthing that possibly a lot of us have worked for and looked for for many, many years now? Is there anything that, that well, what are you doing? What could we all be doing, do you think? I mean, I've no idea if this is right. So I'm just saying, yes, what I'm doing, I want to be in conversation with everybody, you know, and that's why I've done this work with corporations all these years. I, I couldn't care less about organizations. I have no interest in business. For some reason, the stars have taken me into those worlds. So I try to bring all of myself and offer what I can. But it's no different to Embercombe and no different to all the various no different as right now in Dunsford, as I walk along the street and meet, meet a little crowd of elderly ladies who normally go to the church and, you know, are really want, rather wonderful and charming people. And I take Kai around with me because he's a wonderful bridge to the hearts of all these people. You know, it's, we are so steeped in them and us, I feel, so steeped in, in ideas of our superiority or something. And we, so I just think it's in those millions of little things, you know, we don't, that's, that's all for me it is. And that, what I wrote, I think, in that thing was, what if Earth Day was every day? It is, of course. But what if we knew this, were present with this knowing each day, every day, all day? The animals know it, the trees know it, the mountains know it. We once knew it. That's why we used to build our homes with the front doors facing the rising sun, you know? We can find our way, we can remember this, and if we remember it, then we, we are, and indeed we are pregnant with it, we can then give birth to it. Um, but anyway, something like that. Sounds wonderful, sounds perfect, thank you. M Manda, have you got any thoughts about what, individuals can do what you're doing you know what can we do yeah gosh um yes I'll look, yes because so we're back to the head mind heart and spirit and and i tend to at the moment i'm framing quite a lot of my thinking in terms of joanna macy's three pillars of the great turning there are the holding patterns the Gaia systems design and the shifts in consciousness and and I find it really instructive one of the things we did when I was at Schumacher was right at the beginning of the year we we kind of put three cushions on the floor that represented each of these and then organized ourselves of where we thought we were and then we did it again at the end of each term to see if we had shifted at all um, and in each time I found myself in the middle which surprised me until I, I really looked at it. Um, because so, so one of my big immediate things is I think we're heading for a global famine in the autumn, in the winter. Africa is currently in its fourth plague of locusts. locusts. India at Modi just shut them down with, with no support at all. So they haven't planted anything or harvested anything. I read yesterday that Italy is, is having a plague of wild boars and I think, go oh, wild boars, that's amazing. But they're eating all the crops. And, and I look around here, I, I live in a beautiful, beautiful valley in Shropshire, right on the border with Wales. And half the fields are ploughed and the other half are down to oilseed rape and then, uh, no, thirds, a third are ploughed, a third are oilseed rape and a third are sheep wrecked. And I'm doing my absolute best to connect with the people at Tamar Grow Local, which is, we can talk about that another time, an astonishing local growing system. To, we have a meeting tomorrow, a Zoom meeting, um, to try and get that here because I look at that valley and I think from this valley alone, if we were to, to engage in, I've, I've just got this kind of boity toe, but um, it's amazing. The, the, it's printed by a guy in his um, publishing house, it's called 59 Degrees North 
because that's where he is in Sweden. And, and, and he's produced this amazing book. He did it on Kickstarter. Um, and he needed, I think, 250,000 pounds to get it going. And he, within a week, he had three times that. And it's extraordinary. And I reckon if you can do it at 59 degrees north in Sweden, we can do it in Shropshire. Um, and regenerative farming draws in carbon. It, it massively increases biodiversity and it feeds people. And I think every, for me, everything else is, if people are starving by November, everything else is academic. So, um, but I want us, if we can do regenerative agriculture and have those three you know, pillars of, of that, of sequestering carbon and massively increasing biodiversity and feeding people locally, then that's my kind of holding pattern. For me, that's, that's primary. And I, I listen to Gail and go, God, yes, there's so much because money is just an idea. Money is an agreement we make, and we made this agreement that lets everybody, you know, creates a, a, a system that is so unequal, and it would not have to be like that. Um, and I would really like to see a systems conference where we bring together all of the people that Gail talked about, Kate Rayworth, Paul Mason, um, Anne Pettifer, Molly Scott Cato, all of those, to, could, if we were going to design the perfect system, would it look like because i i read all of those but i still don't know what the perfect system looks like um and at the point when the foundations have been broken of everything else how could we create something where there aren't people starving there are people in britain who are starving now because they haven't got food because our system is not designed to take care of people um so so i would really like to to engage with that um and on an individual level i am back to for me, what, matter, what I think it is that I need to find out how can I be the best that I can be? What is the best of myself? How do I bring the best of myself into every moment of living and, and do the wrestling with the bits inside that go into meltdown because, because that's what happens? Um, and, and how can I live that is so... So those are my, and, and then I still, I am very much involved with, if every one of us was the best of ourselves, what would the hyper complex system that we are now, how would that look? There's, because we are, Max said we are a complex system and we, we are, we are each of us complex systems. Our cultures are complex systems. And as of a month ago, we became the most connected set of complex systems that this planet has ever seen. There's a guy called Jordan Hall who was looking at self-organizing connectivity interfaces in December and said that at that point, we were already two orders of magnitude more complex in terms of our ability to communicate ideas around the world than we had ever been. And, and that was December. And I don't know about you guys, but my connectivity online has definitely increased by at least one order of magnitude in the last three weeks. We are now absolutely at, on, a, on an edge of complexity that our world has never seen. And what we know about with our studies of complex systems is they reach a point of maximal complexity and then their timeline bifurcates. And they either crash into chaos or extinction or they emerge into a new system. And I think we are, we have to be very close to that point of maximal complexity. And, and, and so, and, I'm, and I think the crashing into chaos and extinction you know, is still a possibility, but so is the emergence into something that we cannot possibly predict from here. But if we're going to emerge into something else, it is because each of us has been the best of ourselves. So um, you, talk, you talk, Manda, very much about conscious evolution. Uh, is this something yes. we can do consciously? Is that just to be conscious or is it something that we just have to wait and see? I think, well, my, you know, this is where the entirety, 99% of my energy that isn't going into trying to grow beans is going into conscious evolution. Yeah, because we can choose it. I can choose to be the best of myself in every moment or I cannot. That's a choice. I can choose the neuroplasticity of my brain. And I have huge privilege because I'm not locked on the 10th floor of a tower block with an abusive partner who's trying to kill me and five kids that I've got to try and feed. So I, I'm totally aware of my privilege and I am using every ounce of my privileged energy in an effort to create for myself a sense of that energetic space 
where within which that emergence could happen and create that in a way that I can share. Because for me, the, the key to this is our connectivity, not just to other people, but to the more than human world. I, the vision that started Accidental Gods, I won't go on long about this, but was of the earth as that blue pearl in the darkness of space that we all know from the moment we landed on the moon, we've seen that picture. But around it was this hyper complex web of light. It was moonlight when I first saw it because it was the winter solstice, then sunlight later. And at each crossing point of all of these massively complex set of webs was a node of consciousness. And some of these were people and most of them were not. And the felt sense that I had then, and that is, is the one that I carry with me every day, is that if I can stand in my place in that web, utterly connected to the trees, to the red kites, to the hill, to the river, to the rocks, to the sky, to the earth, to the sun, to the people, to the mycelial networks under my feet, and ask, what do you want of me? And be able to respond in the moment cleanly and clearly, then that gives us our chance. So I'm really working on how do I help people to con make that level of connectivity happen? Because I do think this is conscious. I think we can choose this. And the more of us that choose it, you know, I'm fairly certain there's a critical mass, but I don't know what that critical mass is. Um, and we won't know. And you know, this is the point. This is the butterfly emerging from the chrysalis. Nobody knew it was going to be a butterfly until it emerged. We have no idea when emergence might happen, if it happens or what it takes to make it happen. But we can perhaps set the parameters that will allow it to happen. So, that's, sorry, I think I spoke quite a long time. No, that was beautiful. Thank you. That's giving me goose pimples. And just to say that Manda's um, web platform, shall we call it Accidental Gods, is fantastic. So if anybody hasn't seen that, then do do go and take a look. Gail, uh, yes. So we know what you do with Extinction Rebellion very publicly, but just thinking about yourself, you know, what what is, how are you kind of dealing with this? How do you kind of, what, what does your conscious evolution look like then, <laughs> if, if that's not too personal? <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's a cool question. I mean, um, I guess I, I think Extinction Rebellion is quite like a live lab in decentralised organising. And some of it's in, astonishing. You know, we got named the number one global influencer on climate in the world. And we've been around for like less than 18 months when that was said about us. And that's to do with some way in which we've allowed something to unleash. And then there's just kind of like messy things that happen where we, we we get into into places where it's really hard to make a decision or trust breaks down or it's like there's not enough communication information flow and we've got some really good systems thinkers working with us so you know we're in we're in a organizational cycle that's um you know past the honeymoon period let's say and, and needs to build itself back up again if it's going to i mean and who knows you know it's like for so for me there's a lot about trying to be in the non-attachment um but I think it's it's what I was trying to say earlier, really, that the more the more that we've worked on our own personal stuff, baggage, as whatever we want to call it, the, 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 the more skillful we can be. But actually, the more we have systems and cultures that support us, that we don't have to rely on as being skillful. So that's why I think things work has to happen on the different layers, you know, on all the four layers, the spiritual, the personal, the cultural and the systemic and to me it's just re where do people feel the pull to work really the I mean the thing about asking what can individuals do and it's not a bad question but it does individualize what's a, a very sort of systemic as well issue that like you know you can be feeling quite in your equanimity and then you know trigger 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 and boom you're off again right we all know it we all have those journeys so um, where, where, what are the agreements we can make with each other that hold us? What are the what are the connections like this event tonight that remind us that there's something bigger at play here? You know, for me, it's feeling held by the grandmother moon and look up and uh, that was there in this ceremony one time. It's like just you know the hubris that you've got any idea of what's going off. You know, there's something bigger at play and who knows. So those things 
those things really help. I mean, I really appreciate Mac bringing in, um, I mean, the way we've been talking about the idea that we're trying to talk about the end of the world when there's people facing end of the month problems and and the disconnection and separation that can happen there it doesn't feel as I don't feel as separated from that even though I have you know a middle class lifestyle I, I live in a relatively you know run in ish community and I have a you know a lot working my background's working class working class family and feel those connections as well and um, it, it is it does sound a little bit I don't know how, you know, a bit, um, I don't know what the word is. We talk about narrative and story, but it's like, is how do we tell stories now, especially from my perspective, because I'm working on Money Rebellion, how do we tell stories that does connect? And um, I was working with a, a person who's that, that's part of their role in XI yesterday. And I was like, we need you to be our own Dominic Commons, you know, <laughs> we need a, because some of this has to be done really simply and I can I can I can make everything really complex and get very in my head and very excited about theories and and ideas and so on but you know some of the narrative has to be really simple as well and it probably is about safety this system isn't keeping us safe we're not going to frighten everybody but there's a you know therefore we need to reset into a situation that's safer you know like um and and how do we say these things that connects um it's that people think about things like that and thankfully they're in some of the xr teams so um so i i, I think i'm just on the one hand saying hold what you can do as individuals and yeah let's always be our best people and don't give yourself a hard time about it when you fuck up because we're in a like <laughs> you know in this space that's not it's not healthy and 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 i, I guess life will it, as you as you beautifully put it Mandy, it will it will send us off we will send us packing and we'll come up with something you know life will come up with something else that and learn from this thing and even on the even if that's what's happening as i'm saying let's try and love it i, I in in the october rebellion someone came to me and they said something that really struck a chord actually which was if life on earth was dying in such a, a massive massive way if your friend was dying you wouldn't want to leave and say oh, well you're dying I've had enough now you'd want to be there and be present to it so whatever is happening being in in the way you said it beautifully Matt being present to the now and um uh yeah it feels all of these things feel really important. I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, Rachel, but it's it's it's, it's holding all these different layers and 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 trying to move forwards on them and keep together. Let's keep together. Yeah, I feel like it's maybe one last thing to say is um, working with a wonderful woman, uh, many wonderful people actually. Next, our um, Skina Rathoru, some of you will know, been part of the Vision Sensing team. Mickey Kashtan is an amazing thinker. They're working with um, a guy called Victor from the States, but really there's a there's a piece that's needed to shift, I, in my opinion, and shared opinion with others on the progressive left, which is how we talk about change and how we, we have these very systemic analyses of problems and how oppressions show up and talking about words like privilege and so on. But then we very often immediately go into individualizing it and blaming and shaming and getting cross with each other for screwing up and, um, having a more systemic understanding of how that's working and systemic agreements about how we move forwards and an understanding of leaderfulness, co-liberation um, and, and what power with looks like. These are really big questions. If we can birth some of this in our social movements at this time, you know, people working on this, I think this is gonna help us. It's one of the signposts anyway. So um, thank you. Wow, thanks, Gail. You didn't ramble at all. That was fantastic. Um, I have, well, I'd like to open it to questions now, um, which, is, which is going to be uh, interesting. Um, but one has just come up on the chat and uh, I'll summarise it kind of by this question. I'll ask you all very quickly. Um, I know that you all kind of have different um, spiritual practices, if I kind of might put it like that. This is kind of how we, we've been working together on ceremony and spiritual activism kind of over the last few months. There's a kind of question about, you know, how do we 
how do we come together really when there's so many people around the world that have very different spiritual beliefs and cultural differences you know this this connection between us all um yeah how, how do we overcome these differences i wonder if anybody would like to let us know that one gail I mean, I don't think we have to overcome differences. We need to celebrate them in the first case, right? I mean, the, the regenerative cultures, it's plural. There's lots of different ways. And each tradition has, uh, has at its heart, in my understanding, an animistic um, root somehow. And what I mean by that, probably people know, but is, has, a, has a root in, in a story that is of connection and uh, the web of life and honoring and being part of the web of life and um, so it, it like let we each culture has that work to do to dig out its older stories and bring them back into the new there's Charles Eisenstein says the new old stories and what a wonderful party of human beings to share that and um yeah, I think I think it's it, that that it's it's an ongoing question of 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 what people can stomach and cope with right now, and what I guess one of the things that I also want to celebrate, Extinction Rebellion Regenerative Cultures team and Guardians and Vision team and others came up with this sort of alone together and XRTV and all this incredible community holding that's been happening last night we had a candlelit vigil online and celebrated the life of Polly Higgins and um, I'm just saying that in that the, the capacity to try and hold community um, and then from that foundational piece be able to share that I mean there's there's no there's no easy answers but there's there's, you know, what authoritarianism does is it offers a scapegoat and it offers something to blame. It's going to have a go, but it's um, on a bit of a hiding to nothing, isn't it? At the minute, it's really messed up in terms of this crisis. Um, I'm celebrating actually the piece in the Sunday Times by Jonathan Leake and others that was exposing the government's lack of action on this crisis. Our Dr. Rupert Reid put out a message a few weeks ago saying you're about to be lied to the government's going to try and put it on your lap so look their story of we've got we've, we're in control we'll sort it out for you the paternalistic story it's they're going to really struggle they'll try of course and um so I, I guess it is part of that place it's not just telling it it's showing it isn't it is is how we hold each other um and there are many stories that we have in our history to to dig into and and recreate and new ones to tell each other, I think. Fantastic. This idea of contemporary animism is one that you know that we love at Embercoom. So um, thank you for that. What I'm going to ask people to do is if they have a question to wave their hands, basically. And I'm just going to scroll through and see if I can see anybody. If I do, and this will be random, then I will ask you to unmute yourself. So. Let's see if this works. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. Should be an electronic hand. It could be an electronic hand or a real hand. I quite like the idea of a real hand. Yeah. So Ian Bay, Beth, looks like he's got a hand up. Rachel, just in case you wanted to know. Say the name again, Amanda. I'll, I'll write it in the um, chat to you. It is on my third screen. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, let's hear from Sue, who had also raised her hand. If you can unmute yourself, Sue, then I will find from you, Manda, who that was. Oh, okay, Ian. Sue, if you want to go first. Hi, everyone. Um, just thanks to all of you. You're all amazing. Um, I, I, I'd like to ask this question to Manda. Um, when you started, um, with what you described, I just felt it was awesome and I'd like you to speak more about, we're going to kind of quote you, um, um, about the heart-body sense and, and how um, we need to embody and experience um, how, how, how we imagine the imaginal um, of, of our future um, and yeah how can and in, in your space how 
how are you thinking, or, or this can be open to everyone, uh, of how we can teach other people to do that? Um, that's a big question that I'm asking myself as well. So, yeah, thank you. I'm going to mute my... Um, so I wonder, I, I'm not sure that I can answer that more than what I said. The best way to open any doors, I think, is to model, to be, to be the change we want to see in the world, if we're going to quote Gandhi. Um, that said, you know, Accidental Gods is, I, I released this week as a podcast and as a free open to everybody, a set of meditations that would take you into that what if space exactly because I think it is the single most, for me at the moment, important thing that I can be asking and I'm sharing it with, with anybody who wants it. But people have to, it, you can't take someone who's in a dangerous domestic situation, has no food and five kids and go, oh, come on, do this meditation, your life will be perfect. So um, it's got, people have to be looking for something to do. But then I think the best thing that each of us can do, because we're here, because we're asking these questions, is, is to model, to be that. And then if people are asking more deeply, then there are resources online. Um, Nisha put the Accidental Gods link up and there's there's a, a link there. And there's, there's lots of, so if you just go to the blogs and go to what if. I've got a pandemics resources page just for this. Um, so if people are interested, it's there, but I would be really interested. Mac hasn't spoken for ages, I am very aware, and almost certainly has very good answers on this. Mac, do you want to, do you want to add to that? Uh, I think I agree with what Amanda said, you know, to model it. You know, and, and we, how many words is that? And uh, half a dozen words, you know. <laughs> it's like massive, you know, it's massive. And, you know, most of us, I imagine, think that we are reasonably decent human beings. Um, I would also imagine upon closer inspection, we might be a little disconcerted as we, as we look at ourselves rather more rigorously. Mm. So um, if we put some significant effort, and if I put significant effort into how I model this ideal world, this the more beautiful world, this world that we long for, if I model that and I just can do my work and interact and all the rest of it, I do believe it will have profound effect. That's not to say that we shouldn't do all sorts of all the other things, but I think that's the place. Um, and I just wanted to add, I do feel at this time in history, let's say for us in our country, you know, we, we haven't had famines, we haven't even had wars that the majority of us have been impacted by. We've conducted them abroad, somewhere else, as it were. You know, this village where Embukum is, uh, I expect that the villagers working in the fields and in the barns and everything for most of the hundreds and thousands of years, as it were, leading up to now, would have been terrified to hear the sound of a, a number of horses coming up the valley. Mm. You know, it's like, and of the crop failing and, and of the water becoming contaminated, of, of the indiscriminate killing and everything else that was a normal part of life. We, we have grown so, so, most of us who are involved, let's say, you know, many of us, we don't actually know what it is to meet these really difficult times. And so we are, we are in with the virus right now, but that's not the end of the story. This is just one wave that's going over the top of our head. What about the next pandemic? What about all the other things which are gonna be rolling towards us? And this is why, why our individual work is so important, not as the end all, but as the core from which everything else um, goes out. Right. Ian, uh, you had a hand up a while ago. Would you like to unmute yourself? Uh, yeah, sorry. It was really about um, conscious dreaming or social dreaming. I don't know if it's the right term. Um, how is it important? 
it becomes more widespread. Question for Amanda, really. And is this time when we're reflecting a bit, some of us, uh, a good opportunity to achieve this? And are there any sort of guides for what to do? So it's quite a lot there, really. Um, yeah, and you wrote that to me privately and I answered privately. Um, and so the answer- so you did, sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, it's fine, but... Um, so I'm, I'm also processing what Mac and Gail have both said about this is both a social systemic and a personal event. My feeling that has been growing over the last couple of weeks is that this feels, I th no, that's not true. Two weeks ago, I was in a podcast with somebody else and I said, this, this feels like a dress rehearsal. The thing about a coronavirus is that one way or another, it peaks and it drops. We, will, it, we won't be in lockdown for coronavirus forever. That's a given. The things that have been equally predicted. So the next most obvious thing that was at the top of everybody's list is what happens when we hit antibiotic resistance, which is coming down the line quite hard and quite fast. George Monbiot wrote a really rather interesting, every one of his articles is interesting. He wrote for The Guardian and he said, we should be talking about this as much as we talk about football, which is no good to me at all because I never talk about football. But, um, but I am talking to a lot of people about antibiotic resistance now because that won't peak and fall. That's, that's a thing. And we are, we all know, we were aiming for you know, climate tipping points that will not peak and fall. They don't go away. We hit climate and ecological tipping points, then they're tipping points. And, and I would like schools, whatever anyone is doing homeschooling, teach your kids complexity theory because tipping points don't untip. That's the point. Um, so it felt to me that COVID was a dress rehearsal for all of the things that are coming down the line that, that won't pass over. As we've gone deeper into it, I think this isn't going to pass over. It's the world after is, is never going to go back to business as usual, which is in many ways a good thing. We've discussed why business as usual was, was broken, but then it's up to us to shape each of us a system is composed of individual parts. Each of us is an individual part of the system. If we can create a, a systemic narrative, a new narrative, then we can move into it. So, so I come back to, I think that the, the dreaming into is really important. I'm trying to convene, bring together, I've written to everyone I know who's involved in the film industry, which after 20 years of writing books, every one of which has been optioned, none of which has ever been made. I know a lot of television people. And I've written to them all and said, okay, we have all the narratives of how it goes if we get this wrong. We, we know how that feels at a bodily felt sense. Why are we not writing the things that are as compelling as Game of Thrones and as deeply moving as The Handmaid's Tale? The, the things that people will binge watch that show how we get it right. How will it be if we get it? We, we cannot get somewhere without some sense of a roadmap of where we're heading for. And the answers I've got back are, it's really interesting. If any of you, any of you on this call has someone reasonably high up in the film industry who would be interested in doing this because I'm getting lovely answers from really lovely people going, I'm just not sure there would be much challenge in that. Wouldn't it be a bit utopian? And, and does that make good film? And I think, guys, does it feel utopian just now? Really? You know, um, and, and I think you know, Monsanto will still be trying to make as much money as is humanly possible and destroy the rest of the world. It's not like this is going to be happy, skippy baskets of kittens and roses and, and hello trees, hello flowers for a while. But we could at least provide a model. So yes, the answer to the question is yes. I really think it's important that we dream a new narrative, that we bring a new narrative into being. And this, for those of us who are not, in an existential crisis at this moment, this is a massive opportunity. I'm kind of looking at my own time frame and wondering where all the time went because I thought I'd have more time to do this, but that's just because my time management is really crap. I'd love to know what Gail and, uh, Gail and Mac think about that question though. And I I just, just, just on the time front, we have about five minutes left. Oh. So apologies to other people who had questions. Emma, you're one of them. 
Uh, we'll we will have to bring it um, to a close shortly, but I would love to hear from Gail and Mac on that last question as, as asked by Amanda. Um, if we could do it quickly, that would be wonderful. So closing comments, please. And we'll close the I mean, I just want to tell Amanda that Frederick Lanlou is working on that project. You know, Frederick mm -hmm. Lanlou? Frederick Lanlou. Okay. I don't know who uh, he good. wrote the book Reinventing Organisations, which is about sort of teal consciousness applied to, applied to business sector. It's wonderful. Can I be part? Can I join? That would be really good. Um, so um, I just, I need to put you in touch. Yes. Yes. Okay. I've just Googled him. Fine. Good. Thank you. Mac, talk to us about trending narratives. I just feel, you know, yes, you know, would it make a good film? You know, that is so revealing. You know, what if it might make a crap film, but it's the right thing to do? You know, what if Embercombe says, uh, oh, we won't do it because it won't sell programmes, but is it the right thing to do? What if the book that needs to be written, you know, might not find the hard to find a publisher, but is it the right book to write? What if Extinction Rebellion, you know, you know, realizes that actually it needs to dissolve itself and, and its day is finished, as it were, and it doesn't want to do that because it's, you know, it's, it's, on a, it's on a roll, but is it the right thing to do? So I do feel there's something about just saying, what is that action or that place that, that, that just rings true, the sound is true? So I will follow that and I will say to myself, you know, irrespective, of the impacts and outcomes. I have heard, I've been deep listening, I have heard, and now I take action. Thank you. Wow, okay, well, we're gonna to have to bring this to an end. I feel we can probably go on for another hour, but um, time's up, I'm afraid. Um, thank you to all our lovely speakers, um, gorgeous ladies, and Mac, always. Uh, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, just to tell you that Sam Lee is doing a concert tonight, duets with Nightingale, starting at 10 p.m. Um, a beautiful uh, man, songwriter, a musician, friend of Ember Coombe, so just to let you know that that's going on. And um, just I've I've been encouraged by my people to say that if you have enjoyed this, please come again. If you would like to donate, then we have a bursary fund for the people coming on courses after this is over that won't be able to um, pay the fees, you know, just to help a whole range of people come along and kind of experience what we can offer here. And just to say, yes, look forward to seeing you again and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being there. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Matt. Thank you, girls. Thank you, Rachel, for a very lovely hosting. My thank pleasure. You. Lots of love. Lots yeah. of love. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye guys.